Welcome, and my name is Seamus McDonald, and I'm speaking to you this afternoon about tabletop role playing as more equitable, comprehensible input. Thanks to Tamara for that introduction. I teach historical languages, that is, Latin and ancient Greek primarily. I primarily teach outside institutions, online, and I use a living language approach. That is, I'm interested in treating Latin and ancient Greek as languages that can be acquired like any other human language. They should be spoken, heard, written, and read. I do so primarily because of my reading in the field of second language acquisition research. So a subfield of linguistics dealing with how humans acquire second languages, that is, post, uh, well, at languages uh, post-childhood. It's a field, sadly, many classicists have never read anything in, despite teaching considerable amounts of Latin and ancient Greek. This leads me on to pedagogical principles. What are some of the principles that come out of second language acquisition theory and underlie my own teaching? Primarily, the concept of comprehensible input, a hypothesis and idea put forward uh, especially by Stephen Krashen, but also by others in the field. Uh, input is language that a learner hears or reads or sees in the case of sign language that has communicative intent. So input is these incoming messages and it needs to be comprehensible. That is, we need to understand those messages. If we cannot understand them, our brain doesn't know what to do with them. They don't form linguistic data for us. They also need to intend to communicate. There's a difference between language that has a communicative purpose and language as exemplars. Our brain operates less and is less interested in and makes less use of the 500th example of sailors giving roses to girls. Input, comprehensible input, is the primary linguistic data for learners. We learn language as we receive comprehensible input and that's the main thing, if not the only thing, our brains operate on. Not grammar and not translation. So leads on to some pedagogical questions. I ask myself, how can I increase the amount of comprehensible input learners are receiving, both with their time in with me and outside any instructional time? So I'm interested in both, how can I increase the quantity of time? So my aim is, generally speaking, 90 to 95% of the time spent in Latin. But I'm also interested in increasing the quality or the amount of comprehension. How can I make sure that of all that Latin, most of it, 90, 95, 98% of it, is being understood by the learners? Secondly, I'm interested in how can I increase learner engagement in the language they are receiving? We've all had the experience of reading Caesar's Gallic Wars and being bored out of our brains. Why? Because it's not interesting. You may have also been in a conference paper in, uh, in pre-pandemic times where you were stuck in the room and couldn't leave, but it was incredibly boring and you didn't want to be here. Your brain stops paying attention. Thirdly, how can learners experience communicative context other than the classroom? The classroom is one communicative context, but it's not the only one. It might be the one where much formal language instruction takes place, but our brains don't switch off when we leave the classroom. And yet there is a problem, what I call the French restaurant problem. How do you learn language appropriate to other contexts when your context is always the classroom? One way of attempting to solve this, which generally fails, is to role play the scenario. So you're in high school, you're in French class, you need to practice going to the French restaurant, your teacher sets up a fake restaurant and with fake menus, and you run through pre-scripted dialogues or something like that. The problem is this disconnect because you're still in the classroom and your aim is to do the exercise, not to order food. Uh, that's a problem that's very difficult to mitigate in formal instruction. So I want to move on now to talk about instantiation. That is, what on earth is tabletop role playing and what does it look like? When most people think of tabletop role playing, if they do, the classic well-known exemplar is Dungeons and Dragons. Conjuring pictures of uh, mostly belt boys, teens, maybe some uh, these days, uh, a much wider range, sitting around a table, possibly with figurines, possibly with dice, telling stories about fantasy worlds with Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, that's a very uh, narrow view, I would say, of what tabletop role-playing is, but it might get you into the headspace to think about tabletop role-playing as collaborative narrative storytelling. 
That is, we are telling a story, a narrative, and we are doing it together. Each participant then has a persona, a character, someone they are responsible for. So in the Dungeons and Dragons example, you might be a wizard, you might be a fighter, you might be an elf, you might be a dwarf, you might be anyone that fits the world. And as a participant, your role is to speak for that character, so as an actor, and, and to describe what that character does. One participant then takes on the role, the role of a storyteller or game master and is responsible for guiding the game and playing all the rest of the world. That person tells the story, but not by themselves. They present scenarios and then the players, the other players, respond. I would like to do this. I attack this person. I climb the wall. I defuse the bomb. And then in uh, structured games with rules, then dice may determine the outcome. Are you an expert at diffusing bombs? Do you have a good chance of doing so or not? We ask the dice to decide whether you succeed or not. That's not necessary. And in my uh, language version, uh, that takes a, a back seat. Uh, so those kinds of rules really happen off stage uh, in my sessions. What does this look like in a language instruction environment? Uh, so I was uh, fortunate enough at the first two Rusticationes Australianae uh, to, with our New Zealand friends, play Dungeons & Dragons in Latin. Uh, and I've had a, a long experience in tabletop role-playing in English. So I took both these experiences and said, why can't we do this in, in Latin all the time or in Ancient Greek? Uh, and uh, last year I ran two series of 10 sessions, one hour each, in which uh, learner participants uh, participated in, in a story all in Latin, well, almost all in Latin. Uh, in our first story, we played a fairly standard uh, fantasy, historical, Romish kind of world. Uh, and in my most recent game, we ran a series in which we played a game called Shadowrun, which is set in a, a near future alternate history dystopia in which mega corporations have taken over the world. Environmental destruction has run, uh, wreaked havoc. Uh, and um, players take on the role of shadowy figures operating in corporate espionage and those types of things. Uh, one of our players is here in our audience today. Uh, this relates to the principles and goals in a number of ways. Firstly, the, the whole thing is conducted in the second language, in Latin, and uh, we only slip into English to clarify a word or seek an expression, but then back to the Latin as quickly as possible. So, maximum quantity and maximum quality of comprehensible input. Secondly, it's interesting. This is one of the main things. It's interesting. We are storied creatures. We are narrative creatures who love stories. Human beings, I mean. And we are becoming more engaged in them the more invested or immersed we are. So this differs from something like TPRS, uh, teaching th uh, proficiency through reading and storytelling. So storytelling or story asking, when the instructor tells a story and solicits suggestions from the learners and asks them to vote on different things, uh, that's still a fairly externalized story about some person out there. It's democratized and it's involved, but it's still that person out there does X, Y, Z. This type of story brings the learners into the story. It's their story, they're in it. And so they care. They care much more than other forms of narrative. Thirdly, it partially solves the French restaurant problem. Yes, we're still in the context of sitting around a virtual table telling a story. But when you're asked to persuade the security guard to let you through the gates, you are invested in making that happen. And so you're called upon to act out that scenario. You're called upon to speak the words that you might imagine a person speaking in that situation to try and persuade them. And you may or may not succeed. Uh, this is a step towards uh, reality. It's not reality, but it's a step towards it. This type of practice also intersects, I feel, very strongly with questions of equity in our field. Uh, we all know the difficulties uh, facing our field around questions of race, gender, and the issue of slavery and representation. And if we don't, if you don't, you should. Uh, I want to suggest firstly that CI, in terms of teaching historical languages, CI is an equitizing principle. It's not a solution. It's not automatically uh, going to solve all our problems. But recognizing that Latin is a human language that can be learned like any other human language opens the doors in ways that were not previously possible because of our teaching practices. 
how many of us have heard explicitly or often implicitly the idea that Latin is an academic language, that it is difficult, that it's only for high achievers, that uh, it, it, is, it is more demanding and that it's not for all students, that maybe you would be better off doing French. Those things are not true. If you can learn a first language, if you have the faculties of a human being, you can learn any second language provided you are given enough comprehensible input with communicative intent. That is also true for Latin. Uh, and uh, among those I've seen keeping uh, statistics, uh, particularly high school teachers in the US, you can ask me for some details later if you like, uh, putting in place a CI-based teaching practice has changed the demographics of their programs to both increase the numbers, but also to more closely match the demographics of their overall school population in a way that was not represented before. Secondly, tabletop role playing, I believe, forms as a mean, uh, can act as a means of decentering Rome. Anyone who's worked with traditional Latin teaching materials knows that they center very clearly the story of elite Roman males. That there are problematic depictions of gender, of ethnicity and race, of sexuality and of slavery. What if our students can't see themselves in the materials that they are presented with? What if they want to read something other than Cicero? What if they would like to be exposed to the breadth of post-antique Latin? What if you would like to tell stories about the future? Or an alternate history? Or an alternate reality? Tabletop role-playing is only limited by our imaginations. There are pre-existing games, but one can also just make up one's own setting, one's own world, and it provides an opportunity for the participants to place themselves in that world in a character they choose to, to play, and an identity they are choosing to explore that is not bound by the historical realities and problems of ancient Rome. There's so much potential and possibility in this way of teaching. Lastly, let me say, this could be you. Uh, this might be a totally new idea for you and quite scary. Uh, there are some challenges. Uh, it does require a degree of improvisation from the storyteller and the facilitator. Uh, and it does require a degree of active language that you may not have. Both of those can be mitigated to some extent by pre-preparation. I'm not a great pre-preparer. I'm terrible at writing lesson plans and those kinds of things. That's not how I operate, but it is possible to pre-plan and control those kinds of factors. And it's also very scalable. One of the, the, the tasks I take on in facilitating this type of gameplay is I must scale the language. I need to manage the way the language is used between participants and, and, and through myself. If they're not understanding me, then I'm not communicating. And my job is to moderate my language to make it comprehensible. This can be done all the way down to fairly elementary levels of Latin, provided you give them the tools. I've spoken in the last few months to, again, two high school teachers inter interested in implementing something like this with some of their high school Latin classes, scaled down to the level of language appropriate for their students. Uh, if you have questions about this, if you'd like to talk about this, if you're excited, if you're just curious, uh, you can contact me via email, you can follow me on Twitter, um, or you can uh, talk to me in the, comment, the discussion section afterwards. I'd be very happy to field questions about this or other features of language instruction. Thank you very much.